Welcome back to the big Saturday show. The lawyer for the Marine who was facing manslaughter charges for the chokehold death of a subway rider believes his client protected fellow riders by intervening. Listen to this. He didn't enter the subway seeking to you know, harm anyone. He didn't enter the subway seeking to attack anyone. He was really putting himself in harm's way for the benefit of others. Mm. And he shouldn't be you know, pilloried for that. He should be celebrated. And meanwhile, an op-ed in the New York Post calling out liberal New York District Attorney Alvin Bragg for caving to pro-crime pressure and rushing to charge Daniel Penny. All right, we're going to bring in a former DA to discuss this momentarily. But, God, I just want to go to you because this case really has been rattling American social media, I think New Yorkers. When we look at this and we see this rush to charge by Alvin Bragg once again weaponizing his office, what seems like for political gain or for political points, what do you think this tells New Yorkers about the state of their city and the priorities of their prosecutor? I had a former NYPD inspector on my radio show yesterday, and he said, at the very least, he thought that before there were charges brought, there should have been a grand jury investigation, toxicology screen, all sorts of new information and evidence brought to the table before they went straight to manslaughter, too. Of course, we saw protests in the subways, a bunch of agitation, uh, and activists demanding, in some cases, murder charges, which I think is ludicrous here. Look, this is a horrible situation. Someone is dead. Uh, the idea that there's no conversation around potential charges, I don't agree with that, but it does seem like there's been a rush here. It does feel like if you've spent any time in the subways in the city, there is a threat and people come through. This guy was acting in a menacing way. He has a long history of, of violence, including down in the subway. Uh, and this guy stepped up to the plate to try to protect people in that car. And whether he's guilty of a crime or not, I don't know. That will depend on some of the evidence that we don't yet have. But it does just seem like Alvin Bragg picks and chooses when he decides he wants to be tough on crime, which is very rare, like this case, $100,000 bond, really, upcharging Donald Trump. Those are a few rare exceptions to his rule, which is downgrading and dismissing charges. And it does reek of politics. And I think that is part of what bothers so many people here. Well, speaking of the legal angle to all of this, we're going to get into the discussion of the rest of it. But I also want to bring in a Mark Bettero, a former Manhattan district attorney, to give us all the legal background on this. And, Mark, it's great to have you. I think the question that's on the top of everybody's mind is, does this case against this former Marine hold legal weight? Does it really pass legal muster here? Do you think that he could get 15 years does that seem logical? Does that seem right based on the charges and based on the incident? No, I don't think he'll ever get 15 years. And in terms of whether there's a viable case uh, for any of this, what should have happened is it should have gone to a grand jury. Um, a grand jury is still going to have to hear this case anyway. There's still going to have to be a determination by that body of whether there was probable cause. As you know, there are fascinating legal issues related to self-defense or what we call justification. But the fact that Mr. Penny was arrested prior to a grand jury uh, about 11 or 12 days after the incident, when all the facts are not available, it does sound like a political move uh, for the Manhattan DA to signal to uh, the elected officials who are screaming for murder, uh, to the protesters who are standing on the subway tracks and whatnot. There, there's just no conceivable basis for an arrest when it's still going to have to go to the grand jury other than to signal to everyone, we think he's guilty. And Mark, my fellow panelists have some questions for you, but real quick, I just want to ask you briefly, if something like this would have happened in a state like, I don't know, Florida, do you think this would be the same situation given the differences, as we know, between the way crime is handled in New York and maybe a red state like Florida? Probably not. I mean, under New York law, again, whether there is a legal justification defense is, is a tricky question. But Putting that aside, in the real world of fast-moving events on a subway where everyone in New York sees the decay that has happened in the city, has seen agitators on the subway, is afraid of violence, would this happen anywhere else in Florida, Texas, other places? Probably not. Uh, I, what I don't think would happen is a summary arrest like you saw and demanding $100,000 bail for somebody who's been aware of this situation and acted responsibly, hired an attorney, has been in contact with the DA's office uh, from the jump. So 
It, it's hard to say, but this is New York. And as you see, there are quick arrests. I mean, you saw this in the Bodega case with that Jose Alba several months ago. And it took the public pressure in that case in the other direction, I think, to uh, help that result in, in the right result, which was dismissing that case. Mark, th this is Kat. Um, there's a few mitigating, could be mitigating factors. I guess I'm wondering if they are or which kind of role you think they might play, including the fact that there were other people helping him to restrain Jordan Neely. And also the fact that afterwards, when they put him in the recovery position and the fact that Jordan Neely, as Guy pointed out, doesn't just have a history of violence, but multiple assaults actually in the subway specifically. Right. So New York law, again, is very nuanced. With respect to Mr. Neely's criminal history uh, and, and tendency to violence, which is extensive, that actually probably is not legally relevant in this case, because in order uh, for Mr. Penny to be justified, he would have had to have acted reasonably and perceived whether uh, Mr. Neely was using deadly physical force or whether that was imminent. And what you do is you look at all the attendant circumstances as he saw them, and you try to say, was he acting reasonably? And these are strangers. So the likelihood that Mr. Penny would have any knowledge whatsoever of Mr. Neely's propensity to violence and whatnot actually is not going to be relevant. Uh, what I do think is, is an interesting issue is the fact that on the video that you've seen, which of course is not the entire uh, episode here, that there are one or two other people who do get involved in this physically. And what is interesting is they are going towards Mr. Neely, not Mr. Penny, as if they're helping Mr. Penny restrain him. So I think that is a fact that could favor Mr. Penny. The issue for Mr. Penny is going to be whether Neely was using or was about to use deadly physical force, which, you know, that's the tricky question in order for Mr. Penny to be legally justified. But, you know, they'll get that defense out. I believe they'll sprinkle it with lots of elements of nullification. And uh, even if he is ultimately indicted here, there is no slam dunk that he would get convicted. None at all. Thank you, Mark, for your expert opinion and analysis. We certainly appreciate it. Hey, Sean Hannity here. Hey, click here to subscribe to Fox News' YouTube page and catch our hottest interviews and most compelling analysis. You will not get it anywhere else.